So on the back of worksheet 3, so 3b, we're looking at graphing logarithmic functions. And the top of the notes, it says that the inverse of an exponential function is a logarithmic function. So what does that mean for the graph of a logarithmic function? We discussed yesterday how your calculator does a really bad job of graphing logs. Um, for instance, I already have a common log pulled up on mine. This is what it shows me as a common log, but we know this can't be true. Because a common log of base 10 is the inverse function to an exponential of base 10, which would look like, oh, not like that, like this, kind of. So what's written here does not look like a reflection over the line y equals x. It looks incomplete. And that is a pixelation issue with your calculator. So this logarithm actually comes down and has a vertical asymptote right here, but because of the pixel space that it allows for the graph, it doesn't show that little tail down there. So this is one of the first dead giveaways that when a kid goes to graph a logarithm, I can tell if they're just relying on their calculator instead of their brain because they're going to graph a logarithm totally wrong. So don't be that kid. Um, let's look at this example here, which is, I don't think on your notes, but this is a picture from your textbook. So they show you the difference between a logarithm of a base that's greater than 1 versus a logarithm with a base that's between 0 and 1. And these go hand in hand with exponential growth versus exponential decay. Now guys, think about this. If you have a base greater than 1, that correlates to a growth, right? So this would be a logarithmic growth, which is an inverse of an exponential growth. So think about a reflection across the line y equals x. Yeah, that's exactly what you would see. It would be, oh, not that, <laughs> but something that looks like that, an exponential growth. However, if your base is between 0 and 1, that would kind of go hand in hand with your exponential decay. So this is, oh, jeepers, creepers, I cannot draw anything today. It's worse than normal. Um, exponential decays, remember, look like this. So these are a little hard for me to draw. I don't know why. So really not bad, guys, but look. Yes, totally, they look like that. Uh, <laughs> gosh, that looks awful. So it's a reflection across the line y equals x. Um, these are very hard for kids to graph, and also your teacher, apparently. So you have to keep in mind what you know to be true about a logarithmic function. They're going to have vertical asymptotes this time instead of horizontal asymptotes. The transformations are still going to be um, the same as every single function we've ever had. So this little blurb here is talking about a horizontal transformation would be inside of the function with the x. So like for instance, if you had common log of x plus 4 minus 2, how do you suppose that's been shifted or translated? What does that do? Left, yeah. <laughs> Left four, and what do you think this does? Down two. So even though the shape of the logarithm is a little bit mysterious to you right now, the translations are going to be the same. This one's going to be shifted left four units and down two units. There's a question on your test coming up next week where you're just going to graph me a real basic logarithm, and then this follow-up question is going to ask you to write a new function that has been shifted like left four and down two. So you have to apply the transformations to the function, not the graph necessarily. All right, so all the transformations that you guys know are the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, it means yeah. So this again, these are pictures from your textbook. They're much better than anything I can draw, so please do refer to your textbook for some nice drawings. This is on your notes. So this one's kind of already done for you. They wanted you to graph the log base 6 of x function. So this is nothing that your calculator can help you with, though, because you don't have a log base 6, okay? So in the case of no calculator assistance whatsoever, what you would have to do is rely on your knowledge of his inverse, which is 6 to the x power. So what... I don't know if they did that here at all. Not really. <laughs> if you were doing this by hand without a calculator, what you would do is you'd make a t-table for the inverse function, which is 6 to the x. So you decide to plug in your favorite values for x, which for most of us are like, you know, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And then you would plug those in. So when you plug in negative 1, you get 0.17. Oh, they did it right here. Uh, when you plug in 0, you get 1. When you plug in 1, you get 6. And when you plug in 2, you get 36. But this is not the set of ordered pairs you graph. Because you remember, guys, we're graphing the inverse function to this. You would take your table of values and you would reverse them. 
So instead of plotting the ordered pair negative 2 comma 0 0.028, good luck graphing that, you're going to plot 0 0.028 comma negative 2. And then instead of plotting this guy, well, let's use an easier point. Instead of plotting 0, 1, you're going to plot 1, 0. Instead of plotting 1, 6, you're going to plot 6, 1. Instead of plotting 2, 36, you're going to plot 36, 2, which you're not going to be able to plot because it's off the graph. But you get the idea. So this is why I think logarithms are so annoying to graph. You really run out of good points to plot very, very quickly. So you're going to have to rely on your knowledge of where's the vertical asymptote located, what should the shape look like, and then kind of play connect the dots with the very few points that you actually have. So no, I am not going to give you a specifically no calculator test, but you guys have to know how to graph these without a calculator, mostly because your calculator is not going to help you. Um, so here, number nine, log base three of x. No clue what that looks like, but I totally know what three to the x power looks like because that's his inverse. Ready? You're going to pick your favorite ordered pairs. I don't think it tells you how many, so let's just... Um, Let's stick with negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. So plugging in uh, negative 2 into your inverse function. So this is going into the inverse function. 3 to the negative 2 power is like 1 over 9 because you reverse the fraction, right, reciprocal. So I'm just going to call it 1 9th because remember I'm pretending like I don't have a calculator. 3 to the negative first power is 1 3rd. 3 to the 0 power is a 1, 3 to the 1st power is a 3, and 3 to the 2nd power is a 9. Now that's great. If I were to plot those ordered pairs, I'd create an exponential function. But they don't want that. They want the inverse. They want the log function. So what you're going to do now is you're going to reverse all of these ordered pairs. So instead of plotting negative 2, 1 ninth, we're going to plot 1 ninth, uh, sure, <laughs> negative 2. And we're going to plot 1 third, negative 1. And we're going to plot 1 zero. We're going to plot 3 1. We're going to plot 9 2, which would be over here. And the other thing that I would like you guys to plot when you're graphing logarithms, it's not really plotting as much as giving yourself a little boundary, draw yourself a highlighter line or something at the vertical asymptote, so that way you have a little visual boundary to not go through the vertical asymptote, because as I know my graphs are really bad, but there's certain things I do expect, right? I don't need to see like sloppy ends of your logarithm like going through here. Um, and remember, I'm always, oh boy, that's, you know what, that's not bad. A bruzo you win. That's pretty good. Uh, the other thing I'm looking for is that the tail of your logarithm graph is actually coming down a, like along the vertical asymptote. I want to see an arrow on the end and I want you to extend it a little farther than you think you have to because if it looks like it truncated like the calculator would make it seem, I'm going to not give you full credit for that because you're relying on your technology which is not the right way to do this question. All right, now this one. What if we throw some transformations on it? So for any function, when you throw a negative in front of the function like this, what is that going to do to your ordered pairs? That is a reflection across the x-axis, right? So it's going to reflect it over the x-axis, a vertical reflection. And then what about this, instead of just x, now it's an x minus 2. What direction does that shift? Right to. So what you're going to have to do now, all these red ordered pairs I plotted, you're going to have to create those transformations. So this is kind of annoying. 1 ninth negative 2 has now been reflected across the x-axis, so now it's at 1 ninth positive 2. And then it's shifted right 2 units. So 1 unit, 2 units. So it's about right there. The actual ordered pair that we're sitting at, I'd have to do some adding with fractions, and I don't really feel like it. So I'm just manipulating the points. All right, this ordered pair right here is at 1 third, negative 1. So pretend like you're plotting 1 third, negative 1. You're going to reflect over the x-axis. So now you're up here. And then you're going to shift right two units. 1, 2. 
beautiful. Not. Okay, this guy is a little easier to transform. This is the ordered pair 1, 0. So pretend like you're going to plot 1, 0. And this is kind of weird when you reflect it because you're on the axis. You're still on the axis, remember? But then you're going to shift 1, 2 to the right. Or not, if you can't draw. And then this ordered pair is 3, 1. So if you reflect over the x-axis, you're now at 3, negative 1. And then you shift right, 2. And then 9, 2, which I can't really see. So we're here somewhere. Reflect over the x-axis, and then I'm going to be off the graph. So I'm not going to be able to graph that one. Now, the other thing I would like you to graph. That vertical asymptote used to be at 0, at x equals 0, but it was, now you can't reflect a vertical asymptote, so that's not a problem, but everything got shifted right to. So that means your vertical asymptote is now, at, oh boy, that's not straight, is at, is at positive 2 instead of at 0. So that's the other part of your graph. And now your tail that used to be down here is way up here now. Oh, that's just lovely. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, I started so strong on that graph, and then I... There we go. Fun times. You should, in theory, be able to graph these without a calculator, okay? They're not fun. Sorry. Let's talk about some applications, because in comparison, these are probably more fun than graphing. Did you ever think you'd say that in math? The applications are more fun than the graphing? I think so. All right, guys, this function, you do not need to have this function memorized or know where it comes from. It's a derivation of a function that they use in real life. So you have an annual growth rate of R for an investment can be found by using that formula. Where T is the time in years, P is the present value, um, P sub naught is the original investment, and then they give you some clues here. So $4,000 was made in 2005. Okay, so that was the investment. That's the initial amount, P sub naught. And then a few years later, it has a new value of 7,500. That was the current value of P. And then T. They kind of told you T if you look closely, guys, how much time has gone by. Five years, very good. All right, so now it's just a matter of plug and chug into your home screen. So in your home screen for your calculator, you're supposed to type 1 over t times the natural log of, now make sure this fraction is actually in your natural log function, 7,500 divided by 4,000. And remember, this is an R, a, a interest rate, so it should come out like a decimal. Go ahead and give me to the 100 spots, good. 0.13. Okay, so it rounds up to 0.13, which means 13%. Good times. All right, and then there's another financial literacy question. Good news. This time, we need to know how long we're going to let the money sit. And this is a compounded continuously formula. So you don't have to know why this is the formula, but this is a derivation of your PERT formula that we use. So doubling time, T, for the amount it takes for an investment to double, is given by this formula, natural log of 2 divided by K, where K is the interest rate written as a decimal. I think you've seen this a lot in your science class, but between science and math, they just willy-nilly change variables however they seem deem fit. So like this time, instead of R for rate, they went with K. Welcome to math. All right, so Tara's parents invest $5,000 in an account that earns 4% compounded continuously. <clears throat> uh, will the investment double in five years? If not, uh, what interest rate do they need? So um, do you notice in that formula, it never has like principal. We did a few of these in Algebra 2, not this exact formula. But you did a lot of like, when will your money double? When, re when will your money triple? Did you actually have to know how much money you were investing to know when your money doubled? If you remember back in Algebra 2, they didn't actually tell you. They said like, you got some money for your birthday. We did that question a lot. And it doesn't matter because no matter what your amount of money is, it's going to take the same amount of time for it to double, whether it's $100 or $1,000. So you actually don't need to use this $5,000 business. Let's use our formula for t. It says it's the natural log of 2, but make sure you close the natural log function. 
and then divide it by k written as a decimal. So 4.5% would be 0 0.045. So when that comes out, uh, where are we at here? Is it like 15.4? Okay. So 15.4 years. What's the question again? <laughs> Oh, in five years. So no, the quick answer is no, it's not going to be doubled by then. Um, if not, what interest rate do you need? Now this is a little more complicated. This time we do not know the interest rate. So let's plug in what we do know. They say, I'm only, I only have five years because in five years my kid needs to use her money. So let's put a five in for T and then you have natural log of two divided by some mystery interest rate, which they're calling K. All right, use your algebra skills, guys. Let's solve for K. So you're going to start by probably cross multiplying. So you'll get 5 times K equals natural log of 2. And I'm not going to type that yet because when you hit natural log, you get some ridiculous decimal. And I don't want to carry that through with my work at all. But now I'm going to divide both sides by 5. What does that come out to? One more time. 13.9%. Okay. Well, good luck with that. I'm not really sure I know of anything that collects 13.9%. Right. So I think bad news for her parents. They're going to need to fork over some more money, I think is the issue. All right, guys. Um, put that to the side. Could you find worksheet six? We're going to concentrate just, I believe, on 6a today, which is just the properties of logarithms. You did see these in Algebra 2, and it's possible in Algebra 2 they gave you like a little cheat sheet of the properties where like you didn't have to memorize them. Well, you're pre-calc. We're better than that. You need to memorize your, your properties of logarithms. Um, the good news is logarithm properties go hand in hand with exponent properties because they're inverses with each other. You should see some like correlation between the two. So if you think about your product property for exponents, when you multiply the bases together, you're supposed to add them together to combine. When you divide the bases, you're supposed to subtract your exponents. When you um, take a power to a power, you're supposed to multiply the powers together to combine them. So those are all properties of exponential functions. So now we got to think about what if we flip that around and now I'm talking about logarithm functions. So they look really similar, but they're the exact opposite. So if you have a logarithm, and inside of that logarithm is a product, a multiplication problem, the way you split that up is into an addition problem. So it's the exact opposite of your exponent property. So it's log of x plus log of y. Similarly, if you have log of a division question, when you split that up, we call that expanding. It expands into log of the numerator minus log of the denominator, which is the exact opposite of your exponent property. And then this one's kind of weird. If you have a logarithm that's raised to a power, uh, the base is raised to a power, excuse me, the number is raised to a power, that power ends up down in front of the logarithm. Now that is a little harder to explain as to how that correlates to the um, exponent property. But if you had me as an Algebra 2 teacher, I refer to this as the Mario property of logarithms. Uh, this is really just the whole point of logarithms, guys. A logarithm and an exponential function are supposed to, like, undo each other. So the point of a logarithm is to bring an exponent down, because then you can actually solve. All right. So quotient, product, power, property. I don't care if you know the names of them. I just need you to know how to use them. So with the logarithm properties, you're going to have two tasks. You're going to be asked to expand logarithms into single ones, and then you're going to be asked to condense them back into a single logarithm. So you have to read carefully on the instructions as to what they want you to do. If you are going this way in the properties, that would be expanding. If you're going this way into the properties, that's called condensing. And it doesn't matter if you like one more than the other because you're responsible for both. So, 
let's remind you how to do these. I don't think these examples are on your notes anywhere, are they? No. All right. So back from Algebra 2. First of all, be cognizant in pre-calc. We, we switch up the types of logarithms quite a bit. In Algebra 2, they're really careful about like having common logs and natural logs a lot. But if this is a log base 8, you need to make sure that every logarithm you write down in this problem is also the same kind of logarithm. So you have three things that are being multiplied together, and then z is also being raised to a, a second power. So you have the product property and also the power property. But which one should you use first when you're expanding this? So the question is, are all of them being multiplied together, or are all of them being raised to a power? They're all being multiplied together. You guys are like Friday zombies today. It is Friday, by the way. Wow. <laughs> Just live in you up now? All right, log base 8 of x. But how do you separate the logs when you're multiplying them? When you split them up, it becomes a big addition problem. So log base 8 of x plus, and I like to put parentheses around this. You don't have to, though. Uh, log base 8 of y plus log base 8 of z squared. But why is this not fully expanded? You have to look inside each logarithm. You can only have one thing in each logarithm. Guys, this guy has more than one thing. It has a power. So this comes down in front of his logarithm. So the final answer for expanding this one would be log base 8 of x log plus log base 8 of y plus 2 log base 8 of z. Um, real quick aside, because you're pre-calc and you're, you're this good. What does z squared mean? z times z, right? So if you were to break up log of z times z, wouldn't that be log base 8 of z plus log base 8 of z? And if you add two of the same things together, don't you just have two of them? So the power property is actually just a shortcut to expanding a multiplication problem. Okay, so don't freak out like, oh, there's all these properties. No, they really all mean the same. A lot of them mean the same thing. They're just trying to give you guys shortcuts. Now, in pre-calc, it would not be unheard of for you to go from this step to this step without any in-between steps. With that being said, that's not a, a free reign to go copy the key on the homework assignment, guys. If you need to break it up into steps, please do so because you are going to be tested on these on Friday. All right, here you have log base 6 of, oh boy, you got a quotient, and then you have separate powers. Generally speaking, the power is the last thing to come down in these problems. So the first thing you do is break up the quotient. How do you break up the quotient again? Subtraction. Very good. So you have log base 6 of x to the 4th minus log base 6 of y to the 5th. But why is that not my final answer? Because these powers are going to come down in front. So you actually have four of these logarithms, and you have five of those logarithms. So final answer, 4 log base 4, log base 6 of x minus 5 log base 6 of y. All right, let's look at some examples on your notes. So evaluate. Um, the word evaluate indicates that you're going to take this all the way down to a numerical answer. So we're going to use our properties, combine them so it's something we can handle, or maybe not, I don't know, we'll see. And then we will, um, without a calculator, by the way, and then we're going to evaluate down to a single number. Here we go. For the sake of properties, can you guys, um, you want to condense it or evaluate it the way it looks? Your choice. I don't care. If you don't tell me an answer, we're going to do them both ways. You want to condense it or evaluate it the way it exists? Condense. Okay. So 8 to the third power, that's going to come back up. Now, on your little chart, if you didn't have a calculator, you'd have to look up 8 to the 3rd power. Since none of you have your chart out, can someone just tell me what 8 to the 3rd power is? Is it 243 or something? I make that up, though? 512? Yeah, see, way off. Plus, all right, we're condensing, so this power is going to go back up. This is log base 2 of 4 to the 5th power. Again, if you had your chart, you'd look it up. Otherwise, you guys are going to have to type it for me because I don't know what that is. 1,024. See, I'm just making stuff up now. Is it 1,024? Okay. Now, I think we're going to be a little bit out of luck if I go to condense some more because 
I really, really, really don't want to multiply 512 times 1024 without a calculator. Can we think of this in a brain-friendly notation? So like what we did yesterday. So 2 to what power is 512? Check your chart. I think that's on there. Is it not? It's 9. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't on our chart. If I gave you a test without a calculator, I would have to provide you a chart that went far enough that we didn't figure it out. Okay. 9 plus, how about this one right here? <clears throat> 2 to what power is 1024? It's 10, I'm guessing. Yes. And guys, what's 9 plus 10? Take it on home here. It's 19. The answer is 19. <laughs> That's so difficult. Uh, 19, 19. Uh, I know I said I wouldn't make you do this two ways, but I lied. We're going to do it the other way, too. So back at the original problem, since that was like a lot of mental math that I probably regret doing now that I think about it, I probably would have lived my life over again and said, okay, log base 2 of 8. That means this 3 is still in front, right? But this problem says 2 to what power gives me an 8? Well, 2 to what power gives me an 8? That one I do know in my head. That should be a 3. So this really says 3 times 3. Now this part of the problem, which I'm out of room, of course, says 5 times log base 2 of 4. Well, guys, log base 2 of 4 is really saying 2 to what power is a 4? That's a 2. <laughs> so this says 5 times 2. So that was how I should have done this probably in hindsight. 9 plus 10, also 19. So the beauty of logarithm properties is it really doesn't matter. You could have condensed it. You could have kept it expanded. So the moral of the story is what's easier for your brain? We know exponential problems are brain friendly. The smaller numbers possible would be brain friendly. So keeping them expanded would probably be more brain friendly. However, we've already discussed this, guys. I'm not going to take your calculator from you, but the SAT will. All right, so we're looking at example two here. That one's already done for you. I hate when that happens. But let's look at this, because there's a question just like this on your test next Friday. So notice what they did first, guys. They took the natural log this time, but they took the numerator, natural log of the numerator, and they subtracted the natural log of the denominator. Now, Abruzzo likes to put these in parentheses because the natural log is a function, right? And all that stuff is in the function. Take it or leave it, guys. I just really like when that stuff is in parentheses. I think it's easier for your teacher to read, for one. It's easier for you to understand. This is the problem I'm, this is the part of the problem I'm worried about right here. We know when we break up the natural log of 3 times y squared. We know, whoops, we're supposed to break that up into the natural log of 3 plus 2 times the natural log of y. So y, y, y is this a negative in front of both of them? It's because of that subtraction sign right there. If there's a subtraction sign preceding another logarithm expansion, you have to remember to distribute that subtraction to everything that follows. So the most common mistake is kids will remember to subtract this part but they will totally lose the fact that that second logarithm is also subtracted. So if you have multiple things in your denominator, I suggest you either put a gigantic set of parentheses around what's about to go down on your paper, or you make a really big mental note that you're going to distribute that subtraction to everybody. So anything with a subtraction sign in front of the logarithm indicates that those terms used to be in the denominator of a log. All right. Um... This is good practice for, there's some, there's a section on your test, log base 6 of cube root 36. Oh, that's fun. Um, let's rewrite that because the cube root of 36 is not a thing that I'm aware of at least. So log base 6, um, let's call that 36. And then instead of cube root, let's call that the one third power. So this is what I would like to think about. If we didn't have a calculator, this is a great SAT question. If we didn't have a calculator, like this is not exciting to me. I like when the bases match. Remember that property? If the bases match, life is good. Can y'all think of a way to rewrite 36 so that it's actually a 6? Six? 6 squared, yeah. So we're going to rewrite this as log base 6 of 6 squared 
But remember, you still have that one-third power out here. So guys, use your exponent properties with me. When you have a power to a power like this, you would just combine them through multiplication. And this becomes log base 6 of 6 to the 2 thirds power. Now tell me what happens when you have log base 6 of 6. They cancel each other out, the 2 thirds drops down, turns out the answer to this question is 2 thirds. Those are the kind of like tricky math questions where kids, like if they don't have a calculator to explore the possibilities, they kind of get stuck. But those are the kind of questions that differentiate like my really amazing SAT score kids from like the, mm, you you have like the average score for Harlem. Like you have to be able to jump beyond that border of like, okay, if I have a calculator, I'm really good. But if I don't have a calculator, I'm sunk. You're not going to score that, you know, 1200 in your SAT test if you if you are stuck with, I need a calculator at all times because half the test is no calculator. All right, let's talk about this one. It says to evaluate. So in my brain, that tells me I should be coming up with a numerical answer. So let's live our lives again from that last question where we probably shouldn't bother um, ex uh, sorry, condensing it because my brain likes littler numbers. So let's start here. Using your properties from yesterday, log base 3 of 27 really means this. 3 to what power gives you 27? So that should be able to be something in your brain or on your chart if you need it. But 2 times what power would you have to use here to get a 27? 3. Good. So this is really 2 times 3. And then plus, the 4 is going to stay here, but we're going to multiply it by this guy. My brain doesn't think about logarithms, though. It's going to think of it as 3 to what power gives me a 1 -third. What power would you have to raise that? A negative 1. Very good. So from here, I think you got it, guys. 2 times 3, better known as 6. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. So four plus negative, sorry, 6 plus negative 4 is 2. I feel like I did something really stupid there. Oh no, I didn't. My key is wrong. Huh. Do you know what I wrote down? 2 times 3 is 8 on my key. Yeah, good job, teacher. All right, moving on. Expand. So this time we're going, um, we're starting with a single logarithm. We're expanding out to multiple logarithms. Let me fix my key. That was so embarrassing. All right, 2. There we go. So... We have a log base 3 this time, and then we got a whole bunch of stuff inside that logarithm. If you feel like at the end of your practice time on this this weekend, if you're like, wow, I'm really good at these, and I can actually jump from like step A to step, you know, to the end, sometimes I'll believe you, sometimes I'm going to question that. This one I would question it on. There's a lot going on in this question. So the first issue I see is that there's a radical, and your first task is you need to understand that that radical is actually an exponent. So I might suggest you rewrite this as log base 3 of 5. I put multiplication dots in between my separate terms. So 5 times r to the 5th power, only the r is to the 5th power, divided by t to the what power would this be if it's the second power but the cube root? It's 2 divided by 3, so the 2 thirds power. A little bit of foreshadowing here, guys. How many logarithms is this going to break up into? How many terms do you see? I see three terms. I see a 5, an R, and a T. So if you already know that, you're like, boom, boom, boom. I have my logarithms already ready to go. That's great, but maybe you're not ready for that. So if you need to do this in stages, you would say it's the log of the numerator. Keep the dots in between them. I think it helps. Minus the log of the denominator. Now this logarithm has to split further. It's got a multiplication problem inside of it. Bless you. So this becomes the log base 3 of 5 plus, because multiplication splits into addition, this is going to be the log base 3 of r to the 5th, but since you guys like to skip steps like I do, I'm going to go ahead and write that 5th power in front of his logarithm. And then minus, the only thing you're going to do to this logarithm is to bring the power down. So this power right here is going to come down in front of his logarithm. And then it's log base 3 of t. So when you're expanding logarithms, 
a quick little double check is that every logarithm only has a single thing inside of it and all the exponents have been brought down. So if you've succeeded in all your steps, that's what it should look like. Um, let's see. Three is fun. Oh, three's up here, apparently. Oh my goodness. How many terms, with the way it's written, how many terms do you see in that logarithm? And a term would be defined as individual things that are being multiplied together. So like right now, the way it's written, a minus 2 is a term. B minus, or sorry, B plus 4 is a term raised to a power. And then B to the 5th is a term with, you know, B to the power, obviously. So let's try to skip some steps here, guys. You are going to have 1, 2, 3 logarithms. Two of the logarithms are going to have exponents in front of them. Ready? Here we go. So this time we have the common log of the first thing in the numerator. And then you break this up through addition, plus, leave a little space please, the common log of the next thing in the numerator. He was to the sixth power, which means you have six of these logarithms. And then the denominator remembers division, so it's gonna be subtract, you have five of these next logarithms. So minus five common log of B. Oh boy. So that was, like if your brain is ready to map all that out without showing any intermediate steps, that's really great. On that example, I would accept that, yeah, you guys could probably jump from initial problem to final answer without showing intermediate work. Some of you guys could do this back in algebra too. Obviously in pre-calc they get grosser, but... All right, condensing, let's see, blah, blah, blah. This is not on your paper. Let's move to number four. Here we go. So we are condensing, which means we're bringing it back into one logarithm. In my opinion, as a student, this was the easiest stuff because when you're like, oh, am I done? Well, obviously, you know when you're done because you're going to condense this down into like a single logarithm of base nine, and then it's going to have some stuff inside of it. So these questions is expanding, but in reverse. So all those exponents that came down at the end of the problem, this time they're going to go back up into the problem as exponents. And again, guys, I really like when the stuff in your logarithm has parentheses around it. I think it just really makes your math nicer looking. All right, so here you would put the exponents back. If you want to do this in stages, then you'd have log base 9 of x minus 3 to the 11th power. That says 11. And then you're still subtracting log base 9 of 2x to the fifth power. Now notice, if you didn't put parentheses around 2x to the fifth power, if you didn't put parentheses around 2x and you just had 2x to the fifth power with no parentheses, you're only taking x to the fifth power, which is mathematically wrong, so be careful about that. Now guys, what's the property in reverse? When you have log minus log and you bring it back into one logarithm, what are you supposed to do with that inside stuff? Division. Which part has to go in your numerator though? The first part, yeah. So this ends up being your numerator. And then this ends up being your denominator. I know that looks kind of ugly with the multiple parentheses, but I appreciate it because I can see that you know what's going on. Let's see if we can do this next one um, without taking an intermediate step. So my final answer is going to be natural log of something. All right, here we go. Let's collapse it down. I know that these exponents are going up and this exponent's going to go up. And then in my brain, I'm thinking to myself, self, how do I combine log plus log? I turn it into a multiplication question. So this does not have to look pretty, guys. You just have to show me that inside your new logarithm, you're just multiplying these things together, but you're not actually going to do any simplifying. So don't overthink this, guys. It's just 2h plus k to the 3 fourths power times 2h plus k to the 1 fourth power. Uh-oh, I spoke too soon. We're not done, y'all. 2h plus k and 2h plus k are matching bases. So, like, if this problem said x to the 3 fourths times x to the 1 fourth, 
you guys would be able to combine your bases by adding the exponents, right? Isn't that how exponents work? So the real answer to this question, if I add 3 fourths plus 1 fourth, you get 1. So this is the natural log of 2h plus k. Obviously, you don't need to say to the first power. That was fun. All right, super fun. Uh, change of base formula. This is the one that everyone loved to learn about when they learned it. And they're like, why didn't you show me this earlier? Um, we're going to talk about where the change of base formula comes from later because it's actually a technique of how do you solve exponential equations. But this is a shortcut. If you have a logarithm of any base that's not calculator friendly, all you have to do is take the log of the number and divide it by the log of the base. As long as you use the same type of logarithm, whether it's common or natural, it doesn't matter. So like for instance here on your calculator, uh, if you had to figure out without the change of base button. Now guys, the reason I'm showing you this is I've seen SAT questions where like this is the answer choice and you're supposed to know how to rewrite it with change of base. So like the change of base button on your calculator doesn't help you in this, right? So you're supposed to take the log of whatever the number is and they used natural log this time. Um, divided by the log of the base. And then it's going to give you an approximation, obviously, because these are gross, and that's the answer. Change of base formula is really cool for estimation. It's also, like I said, a derivation of solving. So we're going to be using change of base, in essence, when we go to solve next week. So definitely necessary. And I think you're going to need it for your homework as well. All right, speaking of homework, you guys have the rest of page 178. It's on the key that I posted yesterday, so 26, 28, 32, 38, 39, 42. And then I also need you to see worksheet 7, the circled questions. Those are probably log properties, I'm guessing. So we're kind of trucking along on that homework check, guys. It's going to be due a lot sooner than you think. You have a very long weekend here. <laughs> Please spend your weekend get maybe catching up on your homework, guys. Remember, it's a lot of book work. You've had a lot of book work so far. Catch up.